Hey robot makers, I hope you're having a good day so far. So if you want to learn how to build your own cute robot arm with a camera mount, then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name is Kevin, come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code, and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let's get over to our keynote and make a bit of a start. So yes, this is all about making a really tiny, cute robot arm, and I'll tell you why I've done that during the show. So yes, we're going to be looking at, uh, I call this Buddy Junior. So I have this great big rubber arm here that I dropped a second ago that's called Buddy. This is a full-sized rubber arm. And on the front there, we can spin that round. There's a little nameplate that says on it, Buddy. So does anybody know why it's called Buddy? Just out of interest, I shall answer that one in a second. Uh, so this robot we're looking at today is Buddy Junior. This is a much, much smaller version of this. Uh, and I'll talk to you about why that is. So we're going to look at some of the design goals for it, why I've made what I've made. Uh, we're going to have a look at the 3D design as well. It's quite a quick one to do. The very simple parts, very quick to print. And I've also got some um, inverse kinematics. I'm not going to be using Jupyter Lab like it says there. I'll just show you the code uh, in Visual Studio and how I've done that. Uh, and I'll give you an update as well on on Buddy, the full-size robot. If you're here for the live stream, we'll also have a bit of a mailbox and a Q&A as well. I've got a few things to show you on there too. Okay, so design goals. Why did I do what I did with Buddy Junior? So idea, I wanted it to be a very simple robot, very conceptually simple, no complicated uh, parts to it. So uh, it's essentially like three moving parts. It's very, very simple, four moving parts maybe. Uh, I want it to be very easy to assemble, very quick to assemble. In fact, I'll show you one of the prototype parts I made, almost like a lolly stick. So this was one of the original parts and you would simply I'll just grab this uh, servo here and simply just shove the servo through and put it in like that and that's like one of the servos in place now and the other hole up there is for the servo horn you can just see the little cutout for it there so that's kind of what I started with and then I just made it a little bit more elaborate just because I wanted it to be aesthetically pleasing to look at. I wanted it to be fun to play with as well uh, and one of the original reasons I was building the full-size body robot is because I wanted to have a robot arm that would have a camera attached and it can move around a product, uh, zoom in, it can go over the top, all different kind of orientations uh, and I could do some motion control with that using VM. So I had quite a, quite a few problems with this. One of the main things is it takes so long to print. These, these parts for this robot uh, can take, if I just pull one off here, uh, they can typically take about eight hours each to print. So like this little corner piece, for example, eight hours to print that. Um, very nice and everything, but if I need to reprint that, that's a long time. So I wanted to re be able to iterate many times on this robot. Uh, and that's one of the, the reasons for doing this. I want it to be cheap to build as well, so um, using these little SG90 servos, these are pretty cheap. And also the 3D printed piece, I mean it's very thin, it's about 3 millimeters thin. I think it's about 100 millimeters long, 10 centimeters. Um, and yes, very, very simple, very cheap. And it's functional and educational, so it does actually work, it does what I want it to do. Albeit maybe a little bit janky, but I know what I'm shooting for here, so that's fine. I also wanted to be able to hold a Raspberry Pi camera module, the, the latest one, version 3. I think I've got the wide-angle one on there. We'll have a look what it can see in a minute as well. I've also used these uh, PCA9685 boards uh, to control it, because I can plug that directly into the Raspberry Pi. So, why did I make this? So, Buddy, which you can just see a second ago, is um, my full-sized robot. So, um, got eight segments and sorry it's got 11 segments and they take about eight hours plus to print each so do the math there that's like a, a, a week a week's worth of solid printing in fact my printer has broken because i think it's been printing that much i've had to order some new uh, uh creality servos it might even be the driver board well we shall see so i've not fixed that one yet so that one is the full size buddy so buddy junior um, takes about 40 minutes to print one of these small pieces wherever I've just put that piece now So these pieces are maybe 30 minutes 40 minutes depending on the print settings I've got it on and they're quite simple to print. There's no real complicated topography to it So the long print times for buddy were a bit of an issue and if I needed to re Iterate on the design like change something and print it again That's quite a long time to wait almost like a day to wait to find out you need to do that again whereas if it's like 
less than an hour then you can you can basically come to those decisions pretty quickly even though they look quite different a lot of the uh, the math that's going to be involved in doing the inverse kinematics is basically the same so i wanted something that was much quicker to test out my code on hence buddy junior so the electronics let's have a look at how this thing is all put together so like i said i've got these um pci pca 9685 boards you just see the uh, product name there you can buy these from like adafruit spark from digikey pimroni um, you can also get them on amazon or aliexpress as well if you don't care too much about the quality of the components and so on uh, so it works over i squared c so it just needs two wires one for clock one for data and you also need like the voltage and the the ground as well to the side of the board you do need power to the top so i'm ironically using a pinroni yukon to power my board at the moment because uh, that can take a nice big chunky motor a uh, chunky battery using a lipo um, overlander 7.4 volt battery and it can drop that down to 5 volts and manage the overcurrent and anything like that so i'm using that to give it a nice clean supply at the top there the two terminals and then you can see that we've got on the bottom there we've got 16 servo headers so in these 16 servo headers we can basically put 16 hobby servos and control them just over the clock and data using a library from adafruit now the cool thing about these um, pca9685 boards is you can actually daisy chain a number of them i'm not actually sure how many you can do but you can see on the top there we've got those i squared c address selectors you simply just do uh, uh, put like a solder connection a little solder bridge and then you can basically give it the address you want otherwise the default address i think is 40 in hex i think so you can use your i to c tool to scan that i to c detect i think it is on unix so very very simple to use these boards um, the, the usual gotcha is that you're not providing the power correctly in the top or on the the left hand side there's a voltage plus you don't want to use that you want to use the vcc for the voltage coming from the raspberry pi otherwise it'll try and suck all the power from your raspberry pi and that won't be great so this is how i've got it wired up to the raspberry pi um it's showing a zero here but it's more just to be able to fit it on the screen nicely uh, it works exactly the same with the raspberry pi in fact i'm using a raspberry pi 5 on the desk we'll have a look at that uh, that did introduce a few problems before when i was writing the code but that was more to do with how raspberry pi have changed a lot of what they do in the background um it's more to do with um the debian instance that they use for raspberry raspberry pi os uh, on um, the latest version bookworm so i chose this uh, pca9685 board as it's very simple to add loads of um, servos to a project now you can use some dedicated boards i've used this on a lot of my projects previously for just micropython this is the pimroni servo 2040 you can actually have 18 servos on this one and uh, you can see on the back there it's nice and flat as well very easy to uh, uh, to use but this just used micropython i wanted to have the full micro the full python so that i could do some things with the face recognition all that kind of stuff later on uh, we could have I could use that and then control it through um, connecting some other like a UART connection to the uh, server 2040 but I thought for the, for the simplicity of just using one of these and the Raspberry Pi we can do that because it goes straight into the header pins there so you can see there on pins three and five we've got the data and the clock respectively and I've also got uh, five volt power and ground going to power the, the controller we still have power in for the servos so the servos are powered separately than the little pc9685 board itself and you see there i said five volts power coming from the pimroni yukon with the bench power uh, module from a i think it's a 7.4 lipo battery which i've got on my desk next to me so let's have a look at the uh, 3d design shall we this was the the fun part so like i said i started off with this very flat um in fact when i printed this i don't think i'd leveled my bed very well and uh, it kind of warped a little bit so if i just show you that just there you can just see it's like warped a little bit but essentially it's just like a rectangular piece uh, with a hole that's designed for the servo to go in if i wanted some servo mounting screws to go in there they're provided as well and there's also a cutout and i've measured this precisely so that this fits exactly the uh, sg90 servo horns that i'm using so uh, it, honestly it's such a perfect fit i was very pleased with that so this is the overall design you can see there's a camera mount at the top there's a um, the camera the the uh, raspberry pi module 3 camera on there uh, then there's a, a servo which controls the sort of 
what that be the pitch of the the camera then they've got the arm piece and then the other arm piece is exactly the same they're an identical print just there's two of them and then they then fit onto the soft sort of pivot base probably do need to redo that because it's not very easy to get um, a screw and screw it in because the way I've designed that kind of fin that's sticking up so probably just need to re rework that one a little bit um, and, th and then there's a, a bottom base piece as well in fact what I'll probably do on this when I reiterate and this is the reason I I made a small robot arm um, instead of the the bottom servo pointing up I'm probably gonna have it pointing down so it's actually part on that fin piece there the pivot piece and then that means that the base can actually be almost completely flat so that's one of the things I can learn from this already. I'm going to be using these SG90 servos, these really cheap uh, blue with the plastic um, spindle and this plastic gears. Now they're slightly transparent as well. So I'll be using those uh, as well as the Raspberry Pi 5 in this particular case because I had one of those spare. And we're using this with Python as well, full blown Python. So there's the base piece, that's the current design. You can see there's a little hole there so you can stick the, the cable coming from the servo that's underneath. You can see there's a servo hole. Now one of the mistakes I've made, this is actually the first generation that I've printed out. This is the second generation of this base you can see there. Uh, and there will be a third generation as I do that change that I've just talked about. And the reason that this was a um, second generation is I would put the mounting hole precisely in the middle of the circle and it needs to be offset because the where the the spindle comes up through the servo isn't in the middle it's kind of offset to the side so I've not spotted that but the other thing there is there is four mounting points on there so that we can screw this into place and have that uh, nicely attached to the base um, and then simply we just plop the servo in and away we go so nice and simple not too complicated a design um, and it's quite quick to print as well probably about four hours or something like that so then this next piece is, I'm calling this the base pivot, maybe they call it the elbow, um, or yes, the, the, the shoulder perhaps, I think the shoulder elbow, and then there's the camera mount, yes. So this connects to the base, and it's one piece, it's very, very stable, and you can simply put the servo horn in that little gap um, between the sort of two sides on the bottom, and then there's another servo, which is kind of perpendicular to that, which is for the main sort of shoulder piece. <laughs> also put on there some text using the uh, the text function on Fusion 360 just to give it a bit of flair. So then next up is the arm piece. So again, very, very simple design. It does have a slight curve to it. That gives it a bit of stability, a bit of strength. I did find with this one that it was a, it does flex a little bit. So by adding kind of a half semicircle uh, to this, that made it a bit stronger. And it didn't really add a lot to the weight because it's, uh, it's got quite a bit of infill in it as well. So no supports needed. You can print this flat on your... Uh, printer um, and it just prints up so there's no complicated supports needed unlike these when I printed these corner pieces which required quite a lot of support because uh, of the unusual shape they do look very nice though <laughs> it's very quick to print like I said 30 45 minutes depending on the print settings the servo horn fits perfectly I'm so glad I got the old digital calipers out with that one and uh, just measured everything so it fits precisely and I added a rounded effect as well just to the end just to the ends just to make it uh, a bit more pleasing to look at and the sort of semicircular design if you look at it through profile we'll have a look on fusion in a second of, of exactly how all this sort of is put, put together and it adds a bit of structure and solidity without without it looks like a Shakespearean way of pronouncing that I think I did a typo there without adding in much extra weight and like I said I started out with this kind of lolly stick design which worked okay to sort of just get the proof of concept there then this is the Raspberry Pi uh, camera mount now if I wanted to use a different type of camera say I'd like an Arduino cam or some other variety of camera module it'd be very easy to print another one of these this one didn't take too long to print either so there's four mounting holes for the camera there's a servo mounting hole with the little screw holes as well it's a very strong structure it's an L shape but um, the, those little curvatures on the inside give it a bit of extra strength as well again very very quick to print and here we go this is what it looks like when it's assembled so um, all the parts connect together and essentially the servos provide the glue to all this they're the things that are keeping all the parts connected so very lightweight 
strong enough to move our camera about. We'll have a play with that in a minute on the demo. So I'll put it together, it literally takes minutes. That's one of the fun bits of uh, playing with this rubber arm. So if you like what I do and you want to make the more, more of these kinds of videos, please give this video a like, drop me a comment, let me know um, if this is a project you'd be interested in, if you built any rubber arms yourself. And if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing. It means a lot to me and helps the, uh, the channel grow. Okay, and we do go live every single Sunday, at seven o'clock British summer time or GMT, depending if we're in daylight savings or not. Uh, we are currently, so we are kind of aligned with the US again, now that it's, uh, March is over. So let's have a bit of a demo, shall we? First of all, I will just get over to me for a second and I shall just bring up my notes on my other screen just so that I can see uh, what I want to talk to you about. So the first thing I was going to do, I want to show you the Fusion 360 model. So if I come over to here, there's that weird glitchy bug again where I have to sort of flick between, there we go, um, the different parts. Um, we can ignore these yellow things, that's because I was playing about with the, the model. All these are individual parts that make it up and I basically just need to go back in there and connect them but um, the actual thing works fine. So if I can uh, move this around you can see the kind of structure of the, those arm pieces. You can see there that they've got this sort of semi-circular design to them and we can even go in there and do like a motion study. If I go into motion studies, I think we can, I just double click that. I need to edit it. We can just put the speed down and because all the joints are connected, we can get it to, to show you what I'm going for. So you can see how the camera, let's put that on repeat. See how the camera kind of stays perpendicular to the ground so it's kind of going sideways that's what I want to achieve with inverse kinematics so we can work out where the camera needs to be by giving it an x and y coordinate and it will keep the camera uh, parallel to the ground kind of perpendicular so it's always upright that's what we're shooting for uh, it doesn't matter what the angles of the individual arms are the inverse kinematics will take care of that and we have that working in the code it's a little bit uh, hacky but um, that's working fine so let's just uh, stop that okay so yes yeah, so we look at the individual parts here so I'll show you how I sort of structured the project here so I started out with this assembly piece and then I would create a new component in here and for each new component you can select whether you want it to be kind of internal to this file or an external one if you do external it creates like a new model so I did that so that I could then modify them kind of individually without all the clutter of other things that might be on the screen at the same time I even did a basic arm drawing, so I just load up that one. Let's see if that's going to load up. So this takes the, the design and you can have it like a CAD, um, old fashioned two dimensional drawing. Oh, there we go, I just need to accept a thing on the screen there. So yeah, you can then do things like project. I don't know if you've used Fusion 360 before, but you basically you can project different views of the robot. Um, like so. You can even reduce them down if you want to buy. Let's make that uh, one to two. So it's a bit smaller. And you can do all the different orientations of that as well. So that's the, the basic design. So you can see there we've got things like the, the camera module. That's what that looks like. It's a very simple design. We have the base. So yeah, I'm going to change this around so that it hasn't got this kind of lump. That does make it a little bit awkward to 3D print because it's got to print supports up to that piece. Uh, I didn't really like that, so that's going to get reworked. And there is a bit of a gap as well um, between that and, and this, the bottom of this piece. really want them to be as flush as possible just for aesthetics. So yeah, the, the thing that I'd not spotted when I printed this out is it's easy to get the servo horn in there. But actually trying to screw the little screw that goes in there, you're kind of doing that at an angle, it's not very easy. So I'm probably just going to make this off centre, this uh, this thin part. Uh, it doesn't need to be right in the middle. That's just kind of what I assumed it would go, I'd go for. And then this is the arm piece. So we can see that I just added these two little indented lines because why not? It looks nice. We can see that it's very, very simple. And I can even show you the, I modelled the servo horn as well. That's if I go for the sketch on that one. Let's, uh, oops. Let's just move that out a bit there so you can see it. So there are all the different sizes. So 4.7 is the size of that end piece there. 
this main piece here is 7.2 and then we have um, let's try and grab all that little piece there all the sort of cog pieces they might not be quite to scale but uh, I think these five holes are about the same they're all about a millimeter each spaced by about two millimeters um, so yeah that's pretty much how that piece looks and these um, they're actually got quite a bit of fancy detail to them these servo horns you've got like these little ribs that are on there um, you've got the inner piece that's kind of level with that got that kind of side on detail like that that's the kind that came with my um, servos I've got a bag of servos I got from I think it's Amazon they come in like a lot of bags so there's a bag that contains bags which contains bags I'm trying to get to is that little servo horn if I hold this up to the camera get it to hide my face can you see that profile it's quite hard to uh, to get that there you go so yeah quite a lot of detail goes into modeling some of these just to get it so it fits perfectly um, I did model a different style which was based on let me just go down that wrong window which was based on the Smars quad robot I did quite like the the look of these so you put the servo kind of in there that's where the spindle would be there's the little arms and the cable can kind of coil its way around and pop out there and you've also got the benefit of having like a hole there so you can have another pivot so that you're not just having everything rest on this one piece uh, so that's useful if you've got um, quite a lot of weight on the servo and you want to kind of spread that out and it's not sort of angling away it'll keep it um, upright so I did consider that design but in the end I decided not to do that and then you can see we've got different versions there of the, the forearm in fact it was a, a different version altogether that I was originally going for and that's a, another corner variation that I was considering so what I've gone for now is a lot simpler, a lot simpler to print, which is just that, that piece there. Okay, so that's the 3D model. Now the other thing I've done to go along with this uh, particular project, I've started writing up all my projects. And if you go over to kevsrobots.com, and let me just go back over here. Um, and once again, we've got that glitch happening. Let me just click on that and then that. There we go. Um, so I've just got this on my local server, uh, but yeah, go to, to Kev's Robots. Let's go to the home page and I'll show you how to find this. So it's currently the latest blog article, Build Your Own Robot Arm. We can also go up to Robots and Projects. And you can see there under the Robots we have Buddy Junior. So if we click on that, we then have how to build your own these even a link to this video that we're watching now so there's the design goals there's the individual pieces there's the downloadable STL files if you want to download them you can I've got a bill of materials on there so um, the servos I think are about two dollars fifty something like that I put the, the higher price for these PCA 968 fire boards so that's the price that was on Adafruit um, Raspberry Pi camera module is about $25 again you can get the sort of clone version of these for much cheaper and you don't have to use the mod module 3 if you don't want to have that uh, high quality HD screen and I put Raspberry Pi 5 there but obviously whatever Raspberry Pi you have will work fine with this as well I put the code which is on github so it's just Kevin McAleer slash buddy underscore junior for that and that uses this Adafruit circuit python servo kit um, as the code to drive the uh, PCA9685 board so basically there is all the code we'll go through that in a minute and this is kind of an explanation of how the code works as well and there's my little demo program and interestingly I've used this async so I can send it a bunch of commands to move and it'll move all the servos at the same time that's quite a neat feature of what I've done there so this is me testing out my inverse kinematics you provide the x and y coordinates and then it will and it will pass back the shoulder the elbow and the camera positions so you can set them so there we go i just also mentioned about uh, using the pimeroni yukon and the bench power supply module there's all links in there as well so that's the how to do this particular project and i've also built a free course 
on how to use the PCA9685 board with a Raspberry Pi and Python. So that talks you through everything you, you would probably want to know about how to do that. So it's kind of a step by step. Um, talks about how to build the virtual environments, how to install all the different libraries that you need uh, and so on. So there we go. So I just wanted to show you that um, and let's get over to let's go over to Visual Studio Code. So one of the things I wanted to uh, highlight on here is how I put this code together. Let me just make this full screen and I'll zoom in a little bit. So let's uh, zoom in. There we go. And what I'm doing that's a bit different on this particular thing. So I've got Raspberry Pi 5. And I'm actually connecting, I'm on my Mac as you see the screen now, and I'm connecting Visual Studio using SSH to the Raspberry Pi. And because the Raspberry Pi can run Visual Studio, it can also run this Visual Studio plugin. So you can connect to it remotely and run code remotely, which is really neat because it means I've got the, the comfort of my keyboard and my mouse, the screen that I'm using, but I can run this directly on the Raspberry Pi itself. So I can see that it's actually running the code as I want it to. So the way that I've got this code um, sorted out, or kind of organized, I've created a folder that's called Buddy Junior. Uh, and then I've got, let me just hide the archive one, that's that's the rubbish that I uh, need to get rid of. So I've got an app.py, which is the main program. And then I've got this module that I've created uh, that's called Buddy Junior. So there's an init.py, which has nothing in it. That's just the convention that Python needs to say that this is a, a library. And what we have here is the actual code for modeling the arm. So I always like to build a class which kind of encapsulates everything that this arm will do. So you can see that we're not using board or bus IO because they're kind of grayed out a little bit, but we are using the Adafruit servo kit, which is their really nice code for connecting to this. This is actually circuit Python, but it can run on regular Linux, which is pretty neat. That's so uh, one way they've created their code will kind of run anywhere. We are using a time because we want to do some time calculations. Um, we're using async IO, which helps us run code asynchronously, meaning we can run it at the same time, which is pretty neat. And because we're using uh, inverse kinematics, we use the maths library to use uh, a uh, tan2, square root pi, acos and degrees. So then the actual class for the arm, I can uh, hide that code for a second. Let's also just move that down there for a minute. So we've got four channels. So each of these, um, each of these servo header pins on here, let's do the old hide my face thing, uh, are given channel numbers, starting with zero from the left-hand side, going all the way up to 15. So zero is the base. I've kind of done it hierarchically. So the base is zero. The shoulder piece, which is the next piece along, is one. Then we have the elbow and then we have the camera. So that's why they're ordered in that way. And that means if I want to go and add extra servo, say I want to add another degree of freedom for the camera so that it can uh, it can yar as well as pitch. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, we would basically just add in an extra servo and uh, model it out there. And it's much easier using the word, the name of the, the, the joint rather than the number when you're writing code. So that's why I've done that. And they're constants because they're in capital letters. I've also put in here for the inverse kinematics, the length of the shoulder pieces. So this is the length between the pivot point of our servo. So I'll just plop that back in there. So if we were to measure, let's get this out, the pivot point between here and where the, the servo is, is about there. That is about 80. It's just shy of 80 and that small, difference can make a, a, um, an error in and we'll see that when we run the code there but basically it's 80 as good as so the shoulder length and the elbow they're both the same so that's fine then we've got the uh, so we're in the the class here of arm so we define this in it this constructor so this always runs when you very first uh, create a variable of this type um, so we're going to use um, servo kit which has got 16 channels and we're simply going to call that kit internally this self is kind of a self-referential for this particular 
class. So when you create an instance of a class, you create an object, and each object has its own set of these variables. Anything that's self dot is kind of a version for that particular instance. So we've got base, shoulder, elbow, and camera, and we're basically just mapping them to the channels in our servo kit. So self kit servo self dot base. So that's channel zero, channel one, two, and three. And then I'm also then setting for each of these things we just created, we can set an initial angle that we want these to be at. So I'm making these all kind of the middle. If you think a regular servo is when you put the horn on, it's kind of pointing straight up. Um, on the very left hand side, that will be zero degrees. And then all the way over there will be 180 degrees. So in the middle will be 90. Now, sometimes people have that as zero and you have minus 90 and plus 90, but that's not what servo kit uses. So we're setting all these to an initial value. So base to angle equals 90, we'll set that. I've created a, an async routine for calibrating it. So if I wanted to call this specifically to say, set this to a particular angle, and my code's a little bit inconsistent here, so I probably need to just change this. You can see I've, I've started by um, naming each one of the variables. So you can see the channel is the self.base, the duration is two for two seconds, and the target angle we want to move it to is 90. Uh, so what I'm doing in this move to a sync is whatever the current angle position is, we're saying we want to move to a target angle and we want to take so many seconds to move there. And it's a form of kind of cheap servo easing. So it doesn't just move there because if you do that on one of these quite um, kind of weak powered servos, they kind of wobble quite a bit. So you want to move it slowly and you don't get quite as much of that janky movement there. So this is one way of doing it by just providing like a duration. We'll have a look at how that works uh, next. Uh, this is the same code self.shoulder. It just hasn't got the name of each of the parameters in there. And that works just the same as well, as long as in the right order. So we basically move all the, um, the servos to the right angle. Now this is like a generic one, move to a sync. So a sync is a way of, a way of programming where you don't know when something's gonna happen and it might happen at the same time as another piece of code. So you just have to bear that in mind. So you have a wait, which is kind of like, do this and wait for it to finish. Um, and the sync is the way that you, you define this as being uh, using the synchronous IO library. So a sync def, move to a sync is just the name of the function. And then we have the channel that we want to move, the duration we want to take to move to the target angle and then the target angle itself. And I've just got a bit of a debug code there, print the channel is and whatever the current channel is we're moving because we can move any 16 channels we want. I've got some error checking in here as well. So if the channel is greater than 15, meaning that it's out of bounds, it's out of range, then the servo channel was greater than one. Well, the servo channel was greater than, that should be 15 really. It was, and then whatever the actual value is. And if the target angle is more than 180, or the target angle is less than zero, then it's also out of our bounds. So we can raise that value error, but I've actually just put in here, target angle equals zero. So you can basically just cap these off. Really that probably needs a bit of rework because if it was like 180 and we've set it to zero, it'll sort of slam back to the other side. So we'd probably say if it's over 180, then actually set it to 180 and just cap it there. So that's fine on that one. Then we just print out what the, the servo kit channel is and then the actual angle that's being printed out. It's kind of a bit of duplication of what's up there, to be honest. But then what the actual angle value is. And then we say the current angle equals, and I put on here, round it, because otherwise it has like loads of decimal points and that's not really required. You can see down here as it prints it out, um, I haven't rounded it out everywhere in the code. And that's basically just to say, give us the current angle that the, uh, the servo is at. Uh, and it's getting that not from the actual servo electronics, but just from our code from when it was previously set. So when we initialized it, we set everything to 90 and that should give it that current value. And so if we say the current angle is none, which that shouldn't really ever happen, then set the current angle to be zero. And then we work out what the difference between the current angle is and the target angle. So that's the angle difference. And then we can define how many steps do we want to use as we sweep round to that point over a duration that we provide. And we can see the sleep duration is the duration we provide divided by the steps. So a higher number of steps means that it's more granular. So if you've got like a very long time period, um, you don't want it to be sort of 
gently moving like that you want it to be as smooth as possible so um, that helps that and then the actual angle step that we want the, the servo to move to is the difference between the angle difference and the steps that we have uh, and then we can limit the range so range limit is what's the highest value that we want this servo to move to because it might be that there's some something that physically stops it from moving the full 180 degrees for example so we could cap it we could say only move this to 45 degrees so that's the actuation range it says range i think it always starts at zero so maybe that's not quite right i would have thought that'd be like a tuple like a lower minimum and a maximum but i think it's just the maximum and then we have a loop so for we don't need to actually have a variable name in there so we can actually just do underscore because we just want it to loop around the number of steps so that's a weird convention when you first see the book normally have like four n in steps or for step in steps uh, do it until you've uh, gone through all the different steps so we said there's a thousand steps so this is going to loop through a thousand times so the current angle is going to be plus equal to the angle step which we've worked out there is the angle difference divided by the steps so it's going to be very very fractionally small and if the current angle is greater than the range limit or the current angle is less than zero continue basically just means just drop out it's or just go around again otherwise set the servo using the right channel that we provided to the current to the the current angle that we've just set there and then we can then await um I uh, sync IO sleep. So this is how you do a sleep using the async IO library. If you did sleep in here, it would actually prevent anything else running. But by doing this, it can say essentially carry on running other pieces of code. Not sure why I've got that import math there. That doesn't need to be there actually. Uh, I'll not comment it out because I don't want to break my code for when I run a demo. So the next book, the next bit is the inverse kinematics. So this piece here basically calculates what the position of each of the servo should be so it's going to return the shoulder elbow camera angles we're not using the base at the moment because um, this is kind of a two-dimensional inverse kinematics at the moment uh, the base basically like, makes it swivel round uh, and we're not using that in the IK so we basically go through the inverse kinematics so we're basically going to work out the distance between the the target point and the the origin point the origin is on our robot base i've not got anything to sort of demonstrate this but the very base of our robot arm that uh, kind of goes out like that that's the zero point and we basically draw a triangle straight up 90 degrees and then down we want to work out what that long angle is there so that's what the d is we've covered this in previous shows if you're interested in inverse kinematics and then we use the law of cosines to find each of the angles so the angle to the target is the a to tan x uh, y and x the cos angle shoulder that's the shoulder servo you can just see there this bit of trigonometry that works that out and then the shoulder angle um, is the a cos cos angle shoulder plus the angle to target then we work out the elbow and the elbow angle there and then finally the camera angle as well um, we then convert these um, to radians or degrees as is required so I think they provide it those a cos a to tan a tan two sorry um, it works all those are in radians so we've basically just used the degrees function to bring them back to degrees and I've added this plus 90 just to keep the camera um, kind of parallel to the ground it's parallel is not the right word perpendicular to the ground so it's kind of like that orientation and then we simply return back the shoulder angle in degrees, the elbow angle in degrees, and the camera angle in degrees in that order. And that's our code. That's the ARM code. So if we now go over to our main app, this is where we, we use that buddy.arm library that we've just created. So we import ARM. We create a lowercase ARM. And there's our class. And then we can use that in our code. So if I scroll down to the very bottom we say a sync io run main and then we define define this main function here and this is this is all the code that we're going to be running so we can define a speed and an angle that we want to essentially set things to to begin with so i've said there 180 and i'm then saying move to arm dot move to a sync arm camera the speed and the angle that we provided there so they're all going to move down to that 180 degrees um, we then sleep for a second and then we say you're testing our inverse kinematics so x and y that's the uh, x and y position that we want to move the camera to 
and we get back the shoulder, elbow and camera positions when we use our arm.calculate position and then we can basically just pass those in into our next one which will move the arm to each of those positions. Now this is what's really cool, you can run all of those individual um, position statements in a group so you can say await iosync.gather and gather will run all these pieces of code at the same time as if they're threads on a multi-threaded processor. So we do sleep for two seconds, we set a different position so um, we, we did 10.20 so that's the x and y and then we're doing 10.90 so it should move up the, I, the y position and then we, we move that and then we sleep and then we set everything back to the middle position again just so that uh, when we run our code again it doesn't sort of slam the arm around too much so that's our code so we're still connected which is pretty neat what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into sort of a multi-screen view so you can see over here this is the uh, the code that we've just been looking at and we've got all these other different windows so this window up here is pointing to a display that's connected to the Raspberry Pi so I can actually go over to the Raspberry Pi itself. Uh, if, in fact, if I go full screen on the uh, here for a second, let me just click back on there. So what I've actually run on here, let me just stop it and show you the uh, command for this. Um, so I'm connected. I've got Visual Studio loaded and I've also got a terminal connected. So let me just show you the terminal there. I'm connected to this over VNC, which is a little bit laggy, and that's why I wanted to sort of have a camera pointing at a display um, so you can see how fast this is. So I'm simply going to run rpycam-hello, which is the new program that came with uh, uh, Bookworm, and this replaces the lib camera hello, and we do T for time and zero, meaning just run infinitely. And if we run that, this is now the output. I'm going to show you just how laggy that is to... <laughs> on the screen there whereas if I go back to this view over here uh, can you see on this this top one here you can see how quickly there's the camera module and you can see how quickly that's uh, responding there whereas if you look on this screen here it looks quite a bit laggy uh, but it'll basically give us what the camera can see as we're moving the, the arm around you can also see just this one down here that's kind of my back there and my screen looking what I can see and the camera's just next to me here so it's a tiny little camera um, so you can kind of see it kind of side on from uh, this view just here it's um, not even 30 centimeters it's probably like 25 centimeters tall something like that so this the 10 piece uh, the 8 by 8 plus the little height of the camera and the base as well the the actual base is there i kind of got this taken off because it kept falling off and i need to rework that so you can see that we've got the pca 968 5 board stuck down there and we've also got the raspberry pi 5 with a prototype hat drive from um, pineberry pi so they sent me this piano drive it's got these uh, great big audio connectors on it uh, it's not been released yet that one but uh, it also provides uh, an nvme connection on there too so kind of trying all these things out you can see that they've got like a nice long cable going to our raspberry pi camera module there as well so i just need to click on this other screen for a second so on the visual studio i need to click run and then i can go back to um, the code so you can see now that the camera is moving around and then it's going to go back up it's quite quiet as well and you can see on this view just here what the camera can see and as it's moving up it's keeping the camera perpendicular well actually parallel to the ground as it moves up but as it's moving forwards you'll see that it's uh, um, keeping the, the camera kind of pl planular <laughs> keeping it parallel to the to the uh, facing forward that's what I'm trying to say so let me run that again uh, I just need to very quickly flick back to there so you can see what the camera can see there's my hand waving in front of it so if you keep your eye on this this camera here that will show you the uh, the output and it points up now as it moves up you'll see that it just kind of zooms in and that's as it's keeping this nice and flat so I can probably move this other camera around for a second Right, so if I keep that there, move that out of the way. I'll try and get this as flat as possible. There we go. And let's just run that code again. You can kind of see it's a little bit janky. It wobbles a little bit, 
But can you see how the inverse kinematics is keeping that straight there and then it tries to keep it completely flat now as it moves up. You see that there as it's moving it. That's the inverse kinematics calculating those positions. You can see it's not quite straight up. I, I do need to calibrate that back a little bit. So I'll run that one more time. This is the little demo program. There you go. You can see in the top view as well what's going on there. I'll go full screen on this uh, this one that I'm holding by hand as well. So I go to that one there. Let's run this again. So if I just click on Visual Studio and run. So it's a little bit janky. We can see there the inverse kinematics is keeping that reasonably straight. And then as it then goes back up, it keeps it completely planar to the ground. So a very simple robot arm to build. You can see there, very, very simple to put together. And you can see all the electronics there. So this is the Pimeroni uh, Yukon board, which I'm using the um, bench power supply module on. And that's connected there. You can see this uh, great big battery here as well. So that's completely disconnected from anything else. It's just a really quick way to provide power to the PC9685 board, which is there. And interestingly, when I run that code, it does actually turn the base as well. You'll be able to see that there's a little servo horn on the base. You can see that's turning at the same time as well. There we go. You can see the output on that monitor there as well. You can wave up there as well. It's quite satisfying to uh, watch that code run. There we go. Cool, so I think that's everything I wanted to show you on uh, the actual demo of how that works. So let's get back over to our keynote slide for a second. So yeah, so I'll give you an update on um, the, the large robot arm. Um, so I think I got a slide on that one, so yes. So I shared the designs of how I intended to run this. So I've got these uh, very chunky, um, ignore that uh, thing on there. This is me trying to fix my 3D print by testing one of these out. Interestingly, Compared to the Creality one, the ones that are in the robot arm are, are quite a bit chunkier. So these are just standard NEMA 17 stepper motors. They're pretty heavy. There's a lot of metal in there. A lot of uh, pieces of uh, steel, I think, it's in there. So it's very, very, very strong, very heavy. And I thought that there'd be enough torque in there because they're pretty strong magnets uh, to lift the robot arm. However, if you think there's another three of these in here, and these do weigh quite a bit. Here we have body, the full size body, mostly printed. Um, there's just a few sections that have not been printed yet. And yes, I did drop that. Then. And then there's these nice corner pieces that kind of go over the electronics. So I shared pictures of this on social media, and quite a few people came back and said, people who know what they're doing, uh, said they're not strong enough to do that. And I thought. Well, I like to learn by trying things out. So I did try this out and although this one works fine, I used the um, the Pimroni Yukon on the stepper motor uh, module and that one works fine. But when you put the arm on it, it gets pretty heavy pretty quickly. And it, it basically, you can just hear it making some horrible sounds as it can't, um, from, as it can't turn the robot arm. So. I did get warned by people uh, and I was talking to Matt from Veeam and he said why don't you try some more chunky servos because the, the gears in there will actually stop the arm from falling over because if you remove the power from a stepper motor it's essentially just like a freewheeling um, uh, it, there's nothing to stop it from falling over whereas with a, a, um, a servo there's gearing in here and that little gearbox can actually keep it in position um, without really turning anything else, without having any power provided. So I did get people warning me about that. It is pretty heavy and it wasn't able to work. So I need to rework that. And I thought rather than printing out for eight hours at a time, each piece and trying to get it to work with like a different, so replacing the steppers with the servos, chunky servos as well. Um, I thought let's, let's scale the whole thing right down because really what I want to do is sort of learn the, the software, the motion, the motion control software from Veeam uh, and therefore 
printing that massive arm is probably the wrong way to go to begin with. Once we've got the small one working fine, we can then um, scale it up and it's easier to try things out if we know that the, the servos work, for example. So looking at replacing each of the steppers, so instead of having four huge heavy stepper motors, I'm probably gonna have a large servo at the very base that uh, lifts the arm up. The one underneath doesn't have to be that strong. That could probably still be a stepper motor, but the one that lifts up the whole arm up has to be really strong. And I think I've got some very powerful ones. The ones that I bought for the InMove robot that are actually in the, the shoulder of the InMove arm, and that's got a full size human arm, about the same size as the body arm. Um, and then each joint can have a smaller, less powerful servo because it's, li it's lifting less uh, and that will help with the weight as well. So that's what I'm going to try and do um, next. And that's why I've not sort of showcased um, body working yet. I think I've sh shared a few videos on social media about the individual pieces there. So there's a couple of the issues that I've had to deal with. So if you want to get yourself some of these really neat hats, these are really cool to be walking around, say, Maker Central or uh, one of the Maker Fairs. People know that you're a robot maker. You can go over to kesrobots.com slash merch and check out that. Get yourself one of those there. It also helps support the show. And if you want to join our Discord server, we've got lots of people sharing their, their own project builds, helping each other. And it's a great place to hang out and talk about robots. So go over to kesrobots.com slash Discord to get a free sign up link there. It'll just send you an email. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes to, to get that back. And if you want to follow me on social media, I do share behind the scenes uh, and in progress uh, screenshots and videos. So you can go to uh, threads. I'm at Kevin McAleer at threads.net. I'm on TikTok at Kevin McAleer 6. I'm on uh, Instagram at Kevin McAleer. I'm on Twitter slash X at Kev's Mac. And I'm on Mastodon Social at Kev's Mac at Mastodon Social. And I'm also on Blue Sky at Kev's Mac at bsky.social as well. So yes, uh, if you want to join any of those, um, please, please follow me on there. And if you want to help the show as well, you can buy me a coffee. I'm, I am a coffee drinker. I like, do like a coffee in the morning. You can go to kezrobots.com slash coffee. And if you're watching this um, on the live stream you can do a super chat let me make sure we have the super chat functionality switched on now there we go Let's switch on stream elements uh, and that'll get your name popping up basically where my face is there you'll get a message if you do a super chat and if you're watching this on replay you can do a super thanks and that's the same kind of thing but uh, i'll credit you on the next week's show uh, in the the section in a second you can also join the youtube membership program just by clicking the join button once you've subscribed i think that gets replaced by the join button somewhere down there on the bottom of the screen and that will also help as a sort of monthly support for the show okay and it's at this point i will then give some thanks back to the people who have supported so far so we have a uh, kevin simply cy and mark lewis who bought coffees in the last month we have lee we have alvaro marie jeff uh, dean Corti, marlene tom shemi and steve they've all joined the buy me a coffee membership program and on the youtube side we have uh, johnny we've got hybrid we've got dale from hybrid robotics we've got warren stephen jonathan we've got oxrad 39 vince john paul we have alistair cassie tinkering rocks jdm johnny bates we have hans from chair lights michael and of course we have tom as well so if you're watching this on replay you'll now get um, suggested by youtube some videos i think are over sort of this uh, side of the screen so please click on one of these videos this is as good as subscribing because it uh, tells youtube that my content is interesting to you as a person and therefore it'll probably show you some more of them but yeah also do subscribe if you're not already subscribed so it's at this point in the video i'll say thank you so much for watching and i shall see you next time